Hey, this is actually not Taryn Trot, as the uh, title slide indicates. This is Walt Lovers. Um, Taryn Trot, one of our um, faculty here in the Department of Emergency Medicine, put this presentation together initially for EMS Grand Rounds, and unfortunately the computer sort of seized up right at the beginning of, uh, of the session, and we weren't able to record anything. Uh, that happened during it, which was which was unfortunate, because uh, there was a lot of great talk and a lot of great questions answered. Um, so Taryn is actually going to re-record this uh, in the way that he wants it and appropriately, but I wanted to put something out there because folks have been asking for it. So this is my poor man interpretation of Taryn's presentation. He'll actually do it and uh, do a much better job, but this will at least get the, uh, get the information out there. Uh, so while the presentation won't be as good, Hopefully you'll uh, you'll leave knowing something about our uh, eCPR program or our intention to uh, begin an eCPR program. So you might ask what uh, eCPR is. eCPR, ECMO CPR, is uh, meant as support for someone who is in cardiac arrest. And the folks that we're looking at right now are basically young folks uh, who are in persistent VF or VT who had bystander CPR early and can get to the hospital early. Those are the folks that uh, we're interested in potentially uh, making candidates to put on um, ECMO-assisted CPR. Now, what is ECMO? If you haven't seen ECMO before, ECMO is uh, essentially a sort of like percutaneous heart-lung bypass. Instead of having the uh, heart open in front of you, you put in a big... Um, big cannula, big hose uh, into the ves or into the vein and one into the artery and provide bypass support that way uh, for folks that have a, a heart that for whatever reason is not able to pump. You can modify it a little bit and do it differently <clears throat> and uh, just support the lungs, but the folks that we'll be looking at are folks that for whatever reason are not able to generate a pulse, either because their heart's in an arrhythmia or because they're in terrible cardiogenic shock or something like that. Specifically, the folks that we're looking at are, again, the folks that are in VF or VT. So that's a basic overview of eCPR. We'll do this while the person is getting chest compressions. Um, <clears throat> it'll be, it's somewhat technically difficult to do that on a moving patient, but, um, uh, and that's, it's technically difficult to take care of these patients as well afterwards. And, and so that's why it's not available every place. And as, as far as I know, UK, uh, at Chandler Hospital will be the only folks that will have this available um, for consideration for use. That's not to say that everybody that comes in is going to go on to uh, ECMO CPR and not every code, not every person will be a candidate, but for the right person, I think this could make a big difference. So that's that's the basic idea behind eCPR. Um, we do want folks to bring the right people to us and we don't want uh, everybody else from across the across the state coming. We're not t saying that you have to bring every cardiac arrest patient to us. Uh, that's really not the idea. The idea is for a certain group of people, this may be beneficial. And if we can offer this to them, then we think that would benefit them. Uh, but we're certainly not trying to tell anybody that you have to bring your patients to us. We're just saying what we're going to offer. This is, again, a starting point, as the slide says. This will change. Uh, there's no way that this document or the criteria they're in or the information they're in is going to stay exactly the same throughout the course of the project. So this will change. We'll try to keep everybody abreast as it does, uh, but this is where we're at right now. So <clears throat> talk about the proposed model itself. Who is it that would actually uh, get started on CPR or on ECMO CPR? What do I do with that patient? Uh, the first step is you go out as an EMS provider and identify someone that is in cardiac arrest. And you begin doing great ACLS stuff. And in my mind, that includes use of mechanical CPR. Uh, if not, then great manual CPR until mechanical CPR can be initiated. For EMS, I think that means early epinephrine, under certainly under 10 minutes, preferably under about 5 minutes, when you really drill down into it and see my other lecture on, uh, on whether or not folks should change priorities based on uh, whether they're an in-hospital cardiac arrest or out-hospital cardiac arrest. But anyway, <clears throat> we're looking at folks uh, who you go out and find to be in cardiac arrest that you've started on, and you note that they are initially in V-fib or VTAC and remain in V-fib or VTAC despite at least three defibrillation attempts and an antiarrhythmic that could either be amio or lidocaine. Um, those folks are folks that we should, or we would encourage you to say at that point, this may be somebody that would benefit from... Uh, 
uh, eCPR or might benefit from eCPR or at least would be a candidate for eCPR. We should think about taking this guy to the hospital and not uh, sticking around on scene for a long time, which is counter to everything that I've said over the last two years. But I think it makes sense in this case. I'll tell you why in a minute. Anyway, so persistent VF or VTAC despite uh, antiarrhythmic and three uh, slash four attempts at defibrillation. These should be youngish patients, so age under 65. They need to be folks that have gotten early bystander CPR. And we'll say that if someone, anyone, can start chest compressions within about five minutes of the patient's collapse, we'll say that that's sufficient. And then total pre-hospital time needs to be under an hour. Folks just don't really survive that well uh, after it takes you an hour uh, to get to the hospital. You can imagine somebody that's been under CPR for two hours probably is not going to survive no matter what you throw at them. But under an hour, everybody that everybody that does survive basically does so if you can get them, um, get them reperfused uh, and make your pre-hospital time less than an hour. And that's an hour from the time the person calls or the family calls uh, 911 or calls uh, makes a PSAP call otherwise to the time that they arrive at uh, UK Chandler. So you've identified a young person that's in persistent VF or VT that you've shocked three, four times and given amiodarone to, and they're no better. Um, and you've made the call to dispatch, which is 859-323-6215, and told them uh, the above criteria. Somebody that had early bystander CPR, uh, and we think we can get to you within uh, 40 minutes of arrest. Okay. If that is the case, uh, dispatch will confirm that information. Uh, which may take a minute. They're going to ask some very specific questions, uh, but it should be questions designed to tease out that information specifically. If that is all true, then dispatch will uh, notify our charge nurse who will then call out an ECMO code uh, to the responding team. And that responding team is a combination of folks on the CT surgery group, uh, interventional cardiology, perfusion, um, the ECMO coordinator, uh, the ICU charge nurses, Essentially, everybody that you would need to get this person on to ECMO, and they will all head down to the emergency department. This is sort of like a uh, trauma alert except for a code. From the emergency department standpoint, we're going to respond as we normally would um, and try to just do basically the best damn resuscitation that we can. Uh, and for the moment, we're going to let uh, probably interventional cardiology will be doing most of the cannulations themselves. So uh, this is why it's so important because there's a lot of people there that need to get told about this and need to make their way down to the ER. So the earlier that you can notify dispatch so the dispatch can notify everyone else, the earlier that you can identify this person as somebody that might benefit or that we're going to bring specifically to be evaluated for uh, ECMO-assisted CPR, the better. Once you arrive in the emergency department, we're going to try to run, of course, the arrest as absolutely as best we can uh, with the most chest compressions and the least interruption in time and, you know, all the, as best we can, we're going to run this as a damn good arrest. Somebody else is going to be specifically detailed uh, to, number one, make sure that all the criteria we talked about are, are in fact, true, um, but then to look for other, other things and sort of be the devil's advocate. So is this somebody that's got uh, bad neuro disease prior to arrest or has, uh, had a terrible TBI in the past or severe dementia or cancer uh, or some reason they couldn't be anticoagulated or somebody that's been actually out uh, outside the hospital or outside the windows <clears throat> um, that would be good candidates for this? And those folks may not go, if they meet any of the uh, exclusion criteria, they may not go on to uh, on to pump. Again, bringing someone to the hospital, we want to bring everybody to the hospital as a potential candidate, but not everybody that's a potential candidate will actually end up um, on ECMO. So it's important to, to note that. And it doesn't mean that you made a bad call as an EMS provider or anything like that. Uh, there are just some folks that once you arrive, they will evaluate them a little bit further and determine that they may not be good candidates for it. Um, but certainly we don't want anybody to feel like they did a bad job or did something unnecessary uh, by bringing a patient because there's going to be, a, we're going to basically need to see a lot more patients uh, brought in uh, that are not candidates to make sure that we capture everybody. So anyway, if we bring them in and they don't go on pump, uh, you did a great job anyway, and we really appreciate it. It just didn't work out for this person. Uh, so that's, that's what will happen in the emergency department.
again, we'll continue to manage the patient uh, as best we can, um, potentially get some lines, and the perfusion guys will come down and, and start getting set up with their circuit. <clears throat> They'll actually be cannulated by uh, probably cardiology for the most part, interventional cardiology, um, unless they're a child, in which case it would be uh, pediatric surgery. And then they'll, of course, get admitted to the hospital where they could go on to some other therapy. By the way, that, that other therapy is really important. Um, ECMO in itself is, yeah, life-saving treatment, but it's less life-saving and more life-sustaining. It's a bridge to doing something else, to opening up a blocked coronary artery uh, or to being able to um, dissolve or break up a clot in somebody's pulmonary artery, um, something like that. ECMO itself won't ultimately save the person unless you can fix whatever caused them to arrest in the first place. Uh, but it does provide a lot more time than just CPR does. So that, uh, that ultimate fix for what's going on, that's what we're actually looking for. Uh, and the eCPR is just a chance to, to maybe get that person there. We're going to be constantly reevaluating these folks. Um, folks that get ROSC may not immediately go on to ECMO, or if they improve uh, by standard, typical, you know, ACLS uh, kind of stuff, or in our case, we're going to go beyond ACLS and do some high-level kind of resuscitation stuff. But if they get better by that and they don't know, need to go on ECMO, then uh, they probably won't go on to ECMO, although a lot of folks that do get ROSC will have this uh, predictable crash a couple hours afterwards. And so those folks may end up on ECMO support anyway. But if we can fix them the way that we normally would, so again, doing good ACLS, doing good countershocks, uh, giving EPI early, but, uh, um, but with some thought and a nod to the fact that it's not all that healthy for a person to get that much epinephrine, doing that kind of stuff Managing the airway well, doing good uh, small volume ventilation, that's the stuff that will save and benefit most people. eCPR is really only going to help a couple of people a year, um, but typical uh, good standard great resuscitation stuff, that's the thing that will actually benefit most people, uh, and we've got to be able to offer that to our patients as well. There will be some folks that, of course, family shows up and they say, oh, yeah, they're actually a DNR. And, of course, that person wouldn't be or the family shows up and says, oh, yeah, he's got uh, terrible brain cancer or something like that. And that person would probably no longer be a candidate. So there may be other stuff that comes up as well. How many people do we expect this to actually happen to? Uh, who, how many people do we expect are going to be candidates? If we looked at our data from last year and for all of our out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, you're looking at around um, – Eight that would have been candidates. Two of those folks actually went on to ECMO uh, last year after their arrest, but this won't be a terribly large number of folks. There may be a, a field of dreams effect where if you build it, they will come. You know, if we offer this service, we may get uh, more folks, and we're hoping that we do get more folks, but that we get the right uh, people. And this still won't be a terribly large number of uh, people uh, overall. So, Yes, uh, we are interested in more patients, but we're interested in not just getting all patients or not all the other patients. We're interested in just the right patients who might benefit from this. Um, and by the way, this is, a, this is a, a therapy that's relatively expensive in terms of you know dollar signs, but also in terms of we have a limited number of beds and a limited number of people that can take care of this uh, and take care of a person on ECMO. And so this is somebody where we really don't want every cardiac arrest coming and getting put on ECMO. It really needs to be just the right people for it. Um, so hopefully with the guidelines that we set up before, we can uh, keep that to the right person, getting the right therapy at the right time. The target start date for this is September 1st, 2017. There are some questions that came up during the discussion itself. One question was, what are we doing about PEA? Right now, uh, folks in PEA, as best we can tell, are less likely to benefit, uh, although that data may change in the future. But right now, uh, folks that are persistent PEA won't be candidates for eCPR, uh, at least if they're out of hospital cardiac arrests. Um, or rather, it would take a fairly convincing uh persistent PEA in order for these folks to get on, uh, and it's less likely that, uh, that those folks would be offered uh, cannulation and eventually going on pump. 
Uh, what happens if the person, say, goes into VF and you shock them one time and they come back and then four minutes later you're doing chest compressions again because they've gone back into VF? Uh, what about those folks? Those folks would be okay. Uh, they are folks that are actually demonstrating that they've got something probably that, that might be fixable. And subsequently, we want to give them a chance to get that fixed and provide the support that we can for them. So folks that re-arrest with persistent VF or VT, those are folks that uh, would potentially be candidates. The inclusion and exclusion criteria are, again, out there, and Terrence can send those out to, uh, out to essentially all the services surrounding us that have a chance to get somebody here in less than an hour. Um, if you have any question about it, you can, of course, call dispatch, 859-323-6215. Before you make any big decisions, call and ask, um, and they will have the criteria sitting in front of them in terms of who will be a candidate. And that will be fairly black and white criteria, at least starting off with um, and it should be fairly clear within a couple of minutes of talking to them that this either is somebody that might be a candidate or is not. So um, if you have any questions about it, call dispatch early and let us try to help. And if you need to talk to a doctor, tell them you need to talk to a doctor, and uh, we'll get somebody on the phone for you within hopefully about 30 seconds or so. Some other questions that came up, uh, can you bypass uh, a local facility in order to go to some place like UK? Can I drive past a hospital and go another 30 minutes down the road for, um, for this? And the answer is yeah. And if you think of the trauma, trauma system, we're basically telling people to do that already. Or if you think of um, cath lab centers or uh, stroke centers, everybody's kind of operating under this model. And that's actually one of the things we'd like to build uh, and we're not saying that we should be the only place that you take cardiac arrest patients, certainly. But if you can offer something uh, at your hospital that can't be offered someplace else that may benefit this patient, then in my mind, and in most of our minds, this is potentially a pl something that you should offer to this patient. Uh, now, if the patient says, or if the patient's family says, no, 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 we absolutely don't want to go there, then okay. Um, but as best as we know, we are the only folks that are able to do this right now or on the horizon will be able to do this. If that changes and there's a closer hospital or a hospital that you'd rather take your patients to, uh, certainly we're, we're not the only game in town. Um, we're just the only game right now that is played this way. Um, so if you have something that someone else can offer that's different than standard ACLS care, which is what basically the rest of us all offer, then you should take them there. Um, but if you think your patient may benefit from this, we do want to say it's a service, it's available, and uh, we'll be happy to talk with you more about it. One question was, what about transfers? Um, can we take somebody to a local hospital and then bounce them out uh, over to UK? Um, and the answer is probably not. Now, if the patient is sitting in an ED, goes into a rest, and you happen to be standing there and they say, we need to go to UK at that point, then there may be something to be said for that. But transfers off the street, probably not. It, and the reason is simply logistics. It is unlikely that you're going to be able to get that person from the street to the other hospital, get the patient seen, evaluated, worked on, the transfer stuff taken care of, and then actually transferred and get to UK within an hour. So for the most part, uh, if you're not able to make it to UK within an hour, the patient's uh, not a good candidate and you should take them someplace else. <clears throat> Other cases could, again, be handled on kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. It's, of course, imperative for us to bring EMS uh, in on this project uh, because you guys are the ones that are actually out there taking care of the patients to start off with. So I've got some other information about stuff that you should consider doing during uh, your transport with this person and something that if you think this person's an eCPR candidate, you may think about doing. Um, this is essentially a commitment from the hospital itself that we want to be a cardiac arrest center. And this is kind of the first steps toward it, I think. So uh, we hope to be able to offer more stuff uh, sort of similar to this. But keep in mind that while we're not the only place that can take care of cardiac arrest patients, uh, we do feel that w this is something that we are kind of exclusive in offering right now. And again, if that changes, uh, if your local hospital develops the ability to uh, safely put somebody on ECMO, okay, um, you know, take them there. We're, we're certainly not saying bypass uh, somebody else with an equivalent, uh, uh, equivalent ability. 
But for some patients, we know that's not the case right now, and we want to put this out there as something that we may be able to offer to them um, and potentially help save their life. So thank you for what you do. If you have any questions, uh, let us know. My email address is walter.lubbers at uky.edu, W-A-L-T-E-R dot L-U-B-B-E-R-S at U-K-Y dot E-D-U. Be happy to answer any questions that I can, and we hope to see you all around the ED. Take care.